So the first thing I want to talk about a little bit is what muscles do. This first chapter is going to be covering the muscle section. And this is um, chapter 10 or 11. Chapter 10. So the first thing I want to talk about is, oh, you can't see that yet, can you? Let's make this visible. All right. First thing I want to talk about is what, it, what muscles do. It's actually pretty simple. Muscles have a basic job. They just contract. They, let me rephrase that. They cause movement. That's what they do. That's probably the broader definition. And the way they contract, the way they cause movement is by contraction. And a contraction is really nothing more than a shortening of the muscle. So if the muscle is this long and it's attached to something here and attached to something here. When the muscle contracts, it gets shorter. That went diagonally too. Didn't mean for that to go diagonally. And in getting shorter, one end is going to get pulled closer to the other. So the end that moves less is called the origin. That's where the muscle begins. And the part that moves more is called the insertion. That's the end of the muscle. And this is just basic definitions here. So when asked, what does a muscle do? The answer is pretty simple. It causes movement. How does it cause movement? Through contraction. What's a contraction? A contraction is a shortening of the muscle. And where does all that extra muscle go? That long muscle, when it gets shortened like this, it just bunches up here in the middle. bulges. So simple, simple definition. And I don't know, I, I never really know why books don't uh, start off with this because it really is an easy thing that muscles do. Muscles don't get longer other than when we're growing, of course. They are a, a designated size. Then they become shorter. Then they go back to their original size, or at least pretty close. So in the process, they're going to cause some sort of movement. Now, in some areas of the body, you'll hear me talk about a muscle inside of tubes. So if we have a muscle that looks like this, a muscle that looks like this, and a muscle that looks like this, yes, not all the same size for some reason. After nine years of art school, you think I'd be able to do a better job at that. You have a connection here, a connection here, and a connection here. Connection A, B, and C. And we'll call these muscles one, two, and three. So when muscle one contracts, it's going to pull parts A and C closer together. When muscle two contracts, dang it, it's going to pull it's going to pull parts A and B closer together. And when muscle three contracts, it's going to pull parts B and C closer together, which is going to make that circle smaller. This becomes important when we start talking about things like blood vessels, for instance. You'll uh, start to realize that when we have tubes inside of our body, tubes like arteries, tubes like intestines, tubes like bronchioles, 
uh, tubes like the esophagus, if there is muscle within the walls of that tube, let's draw our, our tube in blue. No, no, let's do green just because we don't want to confuse it with a vein. If we have a tube with that muscle inside of the walls, the outside diameter of the tube doesn't change, but the inside certainly changes. So that's gonna change the way things flow through that tube, whether it's air or blood or, or digested food. It's gonna help move things along in some cases. So when we talk about muscle, Obviously, most of what we're going to talk about in this chapter is skeletal muscle, the muscle that you think of when you think of muscle, you think of aching muscles or a person has strong muscles or big muscles, um, but there are other types of muscle in the body. So most of what we're going to talk about is skeletal muscle in this chapter. And skeletal muscle is, for the most part, voluntary. In other words, you want to move your arm or move your leg or something, uh, you can do that. Uh, and skeletal muscle contains striations. When you look at this muscle under a microscope, you see these stripes running across it. That is different from, well, in some ways, different from cardiac muscle. Cardiac muscle also has striations. Not surprisingly, it is found in the heart. It is involuntary. And it is branched, which is kind of unique branched muscle cell. And then we have smooth muscle. No striations, which is why it's called smooth. It doesn't have those lines running across it. Also involuntary. Also, uh, this is not found in the heart. This is found in the GI system. This is found in the um, blood vessels. This is found in the respiratory system, reproductive system, etc. So things with tubes, you'll find a lot of smooth muscle. And it'll go, we'll go through this. We'll see this in the slides as well, but just give me a quick overview of this. So again, most of what we're gonna talk about is skeletal muscle. And there are around 700 muscles in the body, give or take. I know some books say there's more than 700, some books say there's more than 600. So we're gonna say mm, around 700 muscles in the human body. That's a lot. We're not going to learn all 700 muscles, don't worry. I do not know all 700 muscles. Like I said before, I probably knew most of them at one point, but certainly not now. So we're gonna cover sort of the main muscles, some of the main muscle groups and some of the main muscles in the body, kind of what they do, where they're located. Um, and one thing you're gonna find out about the muscles is that they have, often have very long names associated with them. And that is something that people don't like. For instance, let's see. This one will do. The flexor. Hyalysis. I think there's a U in there. Hyalysis brevis. Flexor hyalysis brevis. That's a U. The flexor hyalysis brevis muscle. Well, the hallux. 
the big toe. And so what this muscle is going to do is it is going to flex the big toe and brevis means short. So this is the short muscle that is going to flex the big toe. So they really did try and make it simple. Now, when we talk about muscles, you'll find out that uh, for most muscles that do something, there's gonna be a muscle that does the opposite. That kind of makes sense because if you have a muscle that's gonna flex your arm, you're gonna to wanna to have a muscle that puts it back to the way that it was. And those muscles cannot work at the same time because they're gonna be working opposite of one another. But in this case, if there's a muscle that flexes the big toe, there's gonna to be a muscle that extends it as well. And if the flexor hallucis brevis muscle is a short muscle, there must be a reason why we're calling it a short muscle that flexes the big toe. So there must also be a long muscle that will flex the big toe. Otherwise, we wouldn't have said this is the short muscle that flexes the big toe. We would have just said this is the muscle that flexes the big toe. So if you look at the name flexor hallucis brevis, there's a U in there, the flexor hallucis brevis, you actually get a lot of information from that. From that, not, from that name, you find out that the flexor hallucis brevis muscle is a short muscle that flexes the big toe. But we can also deduce that if we have a muscle that's going to flex the big toe, we must have <clears throat> a muscle that's going to extend it, and we do. The uh, extensor digitorum muscles are going to extend the big toe, that will extend the big toe. And then if there's a short muscle that flexes the big toe, the flexor hallucis brevis, then there's probably going to be a flexor hallucis longus. And there is a long muscle that flexes the big toe. So don't get afraid of these names. They really do give you a lot of information. Remember, the longest named muscle in the body is the levator labii superior aliquai nasi muscle, which is the muscle that raises the upper lip. Come in. Come in. Okay. So the levator labii superiors aliquai nasi muscle is the muscle that just does that. It raises the upper lip. They used to call it the Elvis muscle because Elvis Presley used to do that. Thank you very much. I do. I do. But uh, now I think people would call it like the stink face muscle or something. You don't like someone. Levator labii superioris aliquai nasi. Levator, it acts like a lever. Levator labii on the lip, labii. Levator labii superioris on the top. Aliquai, um, angel, like an angel wing, or yeah, angel or wing shaped. Uh, levator labii superioris aliquai nasi muscle on the side of the nose. Aliquai. I think aliquai is wings, but I think it comes from the, the wings of an angel. So, that's why it has that long name. It tells you all that information. But I digress. So let's get into uh, some of these slides and we'll start our way into the muscles. And muscle physiology, of course, uh, chapter 10. So the muscles that attach to the skeleton, refer to the skeletal muscles because they attach to the skeleton, they help movement, they make the framework so it allows us to move around, which is why you'll sometimes hear people call it the musculoskeletal system, musculoskeletal, because it includes both of those parts, all of which kind of falls under um, the system of orthopedics, by the way. And you can see here, the body has over 600, yes. Maybe even more than 700. 
What does skeletal muscle do? Well, movement, all muscle causes movement of some kind. Produces heat. Now, this is where people get a little bit uh, confused, maybe, because they don't realize that all of the cells in our body produce heat, not just muscle cells. All cells that undergo some sort of metabolism are going to create some heat as a waste product. However, the difference is skeletal muscle cells can be increased in their in, uh, metabolism so that they intentionally create more heat. So if we are, for instance, standing outside on a morning like today where it is quite chilly and we are waiting for somebody to come by and pick us up, uh, we might find ourselves shivering a little bit. And that shivering is just rapid contraction and relaxation of those muscle cells to rapidly contract and relax and rapidly contract and relax and rapidly contract and relax. What they're doing is just general metabolism. They're doing what they're supposed to do, but they're just doing it very, very quickly over and over again, specifically to create extra heat to keep us, well, try to keep us warmer at least. That's the idea. Stabilizing our joints and maintaining our posture kind of go hand in hand because, you know, our, our posture is created by these bones in, partic in particular positions. And if you consider the vertebrae, the ones that make up that column of backbones to protect our spinal cord, the muscles attached to the tendons are gonna help keep them in their alignment. The reason why that's important to realize is because if those muscles get weakened or damaged, that could cause those vertebrae to move, shift their alignment slightly, which can cause the juicy part, that nucleus propulsus of that intervertebral disc to push out to one side which is then going to impinge on a nerve, which is going to cause an injury in that area, which is going to be followed by inflammation, which is going to be followed by swelling, which is going to be followed by persistent uh, pain, numbness, tingling to that nerve. That's what people call a herniated disc or a slip disc, a bulging disc. So by maintaining our uh, strong muscles in our back. We help maintain our posture and we help to keep those vertebrae in alignment. This is also why we don't lift things with our back. When we bend over to lift up something heavy, we want to use our legs and not those little back muscles because those little back muscles are not designed to lift heavy things. They're designed to keep your body in posture. Muscles can be stretched, but they're going to go back to their original length. Uh, this is why, you know, someone can pull on your arm, pull on your leg a little bit, and there's some stretchability between the muscles and the tendon and the uh, tendons. The muscle does not attach directly to bone. Uh, the muscle attaches to a tendon and then the tendon attaches to a bone. So with our skeletal muscles, most of what we see is a bone that attaches to tendon that attaches to muscle that attaches to tendon that attaches to another bone. And remember when we learned the skeletal system, they said all those little uh, projections you see off of bones have a purpose, many of which are to attach uh, the tendons from muscles. Let's look at this. You can see how the tendon sort of becomes continuous with the muscle and attaches to that bone. It is not funny, but it is the humerus. But you knew that bone was the humerus. Look at that big rotted end on it. 
and there's only a small little anatomical and a surgical neck there, so that must be a humerus. So there's something that they don't tell you when you start learning about the muscles. And it's, it's really kind of mean they don't tell you this. I thought so, at least, because I remember when I was first learning this, I was quite confused because nobody told me this. So I'm going to tell you this. Remember, our body is made up of organs, which is made up of tissues, which are made up of cells. When it comes to muscle, we don't call them muscle cells. We call them muscle fibers because they are sort of elongated. And what you're seeing here is a cut section of one of these long tubes that we would call a muscle fiber. Now, inside of it, it looks like those little starry looking things. Those actually represent small little tubes that make up the, much of the inside of this long tube that we call a muscle fiber, which is really just a muscle cell. So you'll notice that there's a whole group of these muscle cells all bundled together into what we call a fascicle. And they're all positioned in the same direction. So when the muscle cell itself shortens, all of these muscle cells in this fascicle all shorten together in the same direction. But fascicles, are bundled together into the muscle. So the whole fascicle shortens and all of the fascicles that are around it are all aligned in the same direction. So all of the fascicles shorten at the same time. So we have muscle cells that are shortening that are aligned with other muscle cells wrapped together in a fascicle that's shortening, that are aligned with other fascicles all in the same direction that are shortening, that's causing the muscle to shorten. All at the same time. And you can see here, there is a wrapping around the muscle, which we find around other organs as well, or separating organs called fascia. That is a separating tissue. In this case, kind of wraps around like almost like cling wrap or a saran wrap, but it helps to uh, bundle it and it helps to separate it from surrounding tissues so that it can work without interference. Now you can see there are linings around each of these bundles. Uh, we're not going to talk too much about the misiums, epimysium, paramysium, and endomysiums, but you can just see that each one of these groups has a lining around it. Now, for a muscle to contract, it needs to be told to contract. And that will come uh, from the stimulus of a nerve. And they're demonstrating the motor neuron, meaning a nerve that's going to cause something to happen, cause uh, an action to occur. So for muscles to contract, they need to be told to contract. And the thing that tells them to contract is a nerve. And I will break down the physiology of that very, very shortly. We talked about tendons a little bit. Uh, in some areas of the body, there are these broad flat sheets of tendons really is what they're, I mean, for lack of a better term, they're like tendons called aponeuroses. And what they're gonna do is they're gonna act as anchoring sites, especially in kind of flat areas. So when we see the pictures here coming up, we see the picture of the abdomen, for instance, uh, you'll see that there's a big flat sheet of tissue that muscles attach directly to. And so in, in that case, they kind of end up pulling against one another. So that's an anchoring point. And you see it like on the skull as well. It's very obvious in those places. And I talked about the fascia already. Okay, talked about those. There are 
Mm. There are other differences, not just the fact that we call muscle cells muscle fibers, uh, but there are other terms that we use. Instead of calling a muscle cells plasma membrane a plasma membrane, we call it a sarcolemma. Instead of calling the cytoplasm inside uh, the cytoplasm, we call it the sarcoplasm. Uh, there's a sarcoplasmic reticulum, which is uh, really important when it comes to storage of calcium, we'll see. The T tubules are just sort of invaginations uh, that allow for a signal to travel inside of uh, each of the cells, the signal being this signal that originated from the nerves, as we'll see. Then inside of each of those muscle fibers, there are these extensions of filaments, thick and thin filaments, as we will, as will come up also. So I know the first time you see an image like this, it looks kind of confusing. Uh, but what you have to first imagine is that this whole thing right here is a cut section of a long tube called a muscle cell or a muscle fiber. And inside of that long tube, that is the muscle cell or the muscle fiber, there are these myofibrils, myofibril, which is made up of these different size filaments, thick and thin filaments. That is where the contraction takes place. It is within those filaments. It is the fact that those filaments actually become shorter or actually slide across one another cause the myofibril, excuse me, to become shorter. And then of all of these are acting at the same time, the entire muscle cell becomes shorter. And they're all bundled together in fascicles, which then become shorter, which are all been bundled together in a muscle, which of course then become shorter. And you can see there's a lot of mitochondria in that um, sarcoplasm. All right, so what do all of these things mean? Let me go back to here for just a minute. Mm, no. I'll come back to that. All right, I think this is where I'm going to be. Yeah, this is where I'm going to switch over. I'm going to try and make it a little bit easier because this is the physiology of the muscle. So in order for a muscle to do something, it has to be told to do something. And that is going to be in the form of a nerve sending a signal. So these will represent the ends of the neurons, the nerve cells. And they are going to be packed with, down here at least, vesicles we'll call this area the neuromuscular junction jxn is just junction so we'll put the muscle maybe somewhere like this Okay. Maybe I'll do this down here, just out of the way a little bit. Hmm. All right. So we have these neurons, and there is going to be a signal coming down the neurons, and we call that signal an action potential. It's a very fancy name. It's just an electrical signal. And it travels very, very fast. The action potential. 
it travels down the neuron um, like lightning fast, which is why I showed kind of like a lightning bolt. But it's an electrical signal. And the muscle is going to need more of a chemical signal in order to do anything. So the muscle has receptors and there is a chemical that will be released from the neurons across this space that will bind with those receptors which will change the permeability of the membrane. Remember, a membrane is there to keep things out. We want to keep out, keep things that we want to keep in. And I said before, if something goes into the cell, the inside of the cell becomes different. If something leaves the cell, the inside of the cell becomes different. And when the inside of the cell becomes different, something could potentially happen. So this action potential comes down the nerve in the form of an electrical signal when it gets to the very end of the nerve, there are calcium channels here where calcium, which is CA++, is going to move into the end of the neuron, which causes the release of uh, this neurotransmitter in purple. And that is called acetylcholine. That is the neurotransmitter. Acetylcholine is going to get released then from those neurons. So what has just happened is an electrical signal comes down a nerve, gets to the end of the nerve, gets to the end of these nerve cells, and that electrical signal is what I almost said transferred, that's not right, is changed into a chemical signal. So now this chemical signal moves across this neuromuscular junction and binds to these receptors on the muscle cell membrane. So this whole space gets flooded with this neurotransmitter acetylcholine, which is then just going to bind to all these receptors. As it binds to these receptors, that's going to cause a change in the membrane, which causes sodium to come in. So now we have increased amount of sodium inside of the cell, inside of the, of the uh, neuron, I'm sorry, inside of the muscle cell that sodium is going to act like an electrical signal back inside of the cell that is going to cause a storage site inside of the cell that is full of calcium to release the calcium and flood the inner part of the muscle cell. That calcium flooding the inner part of the muscle cell is going to cause these thin filaments to get pulled across these thick filaments, which is going to cause the entire muscle cell to shorten, which will cause the fascicle to shorten, which will cause the muscle to shorten which is what we call contraction of bloody hell. Okay. So let me go through this again. For a muscle to contract, it needs to be told to contract. So a signal is going to get sent down a nerve in the form of what we call an action potential. That's just an electrical signal. That is going to get sent down the nerve, gets to the end of the nerve, to the neurons, the end of the neurons, which are the cells of the nerve. That's going to cause calcium channels to allow calcium to come into the end of the neuron. 
that calcium coming into the neuron is going to release acetylcholine, this neurotransmitter, across the neuromuscular junction. It's going to flood that space. That neuro, uh, neurotransmitter, acetylcholine, is going to bind to the receptors that are on the muscle. All of that acetylcholine binding to the receptors on that muscle is going to cause the cell membrane to allow sodium to come into the cell. As sodium comes into the cell, that's going to cause calcium that's stored inside of a little, its own little uh, cabinet inside of the muscle cell to be released, and that's going to flood the inside of the muscle cell. The calcium flooding the inside of the muscle cell causes these thin filaments to get pulled across this thick filament, which causes the whole um, myofibril to get shortened, which causes the whole muscle cell to get shortened, which causes the whole fascicle to get shortened, which causes the whole muscle to get shortened. Meanwhile, there is a guy in this space called cholinesterase. Let me put his name here. Oops. Choline. It's an E. Esterase. Although some will call him acetylcholine esterase. And what he does is he recycles that acetylcholine because when those neurons release acetylcholine, it completely floods that neuromuscular junction space. So he's going to pick up extra and he's going to recycle it back into the neurons as well as acetylcholine that's been used. He's going to recycle that, bring it back up to the neuron so it can be used again. Now imagine this. Imagine just for a moment what it takes to move your muscle. If any movement in your body, if you're thinking about blinking your eyes, that's a movement. Um, straightening your finger, curling your fingers, uh, curling your toes, straightening your leg. If somebody throws a ball to you and you have to reach out and grab it, how many muscles are involved in that? You're using muscles in your torso, muscles in your shoulder, muscles in your arm, uh, muscles in your hand. You're using muscles in your eyes as you're tracking it fly through the air. And then when you catch it, you're using muscles to grab it and then pull it back into you. Every one of those muscles, in order for them to do that, a signal has to go down a neuron, down a nerve, uh, in the form of an action potential, that's an electrical signal. When it gets to the end of the neuron, that activates calcium channels to cause calcium to come into the end of the neuron. The calcium coming into the end of the neuron causes the release of acetylcholine across that a neuromuscular junction, that space. Acetylcholine, this neurotransmitter, is going to bind to the receptors on the muscle fiber. As it binds to the receptors on the muscle fiber, that causes a change in the permeability of the cell membrane, which causes sodium to come rushing into the muscle fiber. As sodium comes into the muscle fiber, now it's back into an electrical current inside of the cell, which causes the release of intracellular stored calcium to flood the inside of the muscle cell. The calcium flooding the inside of the cell is going to cause these thin filaments get pulled across these thick filaments. In the process of pulling these filaments across, that's going to shorten the myofibrils, which shortens the muscle cell, which shortens the fascicle, which shortens the muscle. Meanwhile, cholinesterase is going to go through picking up all this uh, acetylcholine and recycling it into the nerves. Every time a muscle contracts, it has to go through that. Now, if you're sitting here thinking, I, I can't even imagine how fast all of that happens. Uh, yeah, neither can I. It's faster than my, my imagination can work. I have to slow things down in order to see this actually happening. And you notice the neuromuscular junction that I've drawn here, this little neuromuscular junction, the space between the neurons and the muscle, it looks like well, several inch or a couple, several centimeters at least across. Uh, the reality is, they're so close, they're almost touching. So if you're looking at this under a microscope, it looks like they're touching. So that, that space, that neuromuscular junction is actually really, really, really small. In order for a muscle to contract, it has to be told to contract. The nerves tell the muscle to contract. So a signal has to go down the nerve in the form of what we call an action potential. This is that lightning speed. When it gets to the end of the nerve, it's going to cause calcium channels to open up. So calcium will go into the end of the nerve. 
into the end of these cells of the neurons, which will cause the release of the neurotransmitter acetylcholine. Acetylcholine will flood that neuromuscular junction and bind to receptors that are on the muscle fiber. That binding to the receptors is going to cause a change in the permeability of the membrane, which causes sodium to move into the muscle cell, which now it's converted, that's more of an electrical signal now inside of the muscle cell. That is going to cause the release of calcium that is stored inside of containers inside of the muscle cell. That calcium floods the inside of the muscle cell, which then causes these thin filaments to get pulled across these thick filaments. That is going to cause the myofibrils to shorten which causes the muscle cell to shorten, which causes the muscle fascicle to shorten, which causes the muscle to shorten. Meanwhile, choline esterase goes through and cleans up, uh, recycles all that extra acetylcholine. That's the basic physiology of the muscle. And I realize that it seems a bit complicated the first 10 times you hear it, but I will assure you that it's actually a fairly simple uh, physiology, actually, when it, when it comes down to physiology in general, it's fairly simple, fairly straightforward. I know it doesn't seem like it, but it is. So here is the end of that, those neurons that I was drawing. Here are those vesicles that are filled with acetylcholine. Notice they have capital A, capital C, small h, that stands for acetylcholine. And here it looks like it's touching the cell, but it's actually, there is a gap there. And you can see the acetylcholine uh, moving across that gap and moving into receptor sites, binding to those receptors. That's what causes the change in the permeability of the cell membrane, which, allow, which allows sodium to come rush, uh, rushing in. So if we go back to this image for a moment, you can kind of see them here. I think there's a better picture actually coming up. But you can kind of see them here, these thin filaments attached at this Z-disc, the thick filaments in between and thin filaments attached at this Z disc over here. It's just not marked. So what's gonna happen is these filaments over here are gonna get pulled closer to the center. These filaments over here are gonna get pulled closer to the center. So those two Z discs are gonna get pulled closer together, which is gonna cause that area to shorten. That whole area is what we call the sarcomere. So let me jump back ahead. You can see in here the, the release of the calcium from those storage areas. Uh, what this red arrow is indicating is actually the flow of the sodium as it comes into the cell, it changes that's gonna change the, um, no, it's gonna cause the release of, sorry, calcium inside. But that sodium creates an electrical charge because it becomes more positive on the inside of the membrane. That is what is becoming this electrical current. And because that happens, it causes the release of that calcium, which causes This area of uh, tropomyosin, you see right there, to kind of move out of the way. You see when calcium comes in and hits that, it moves it out of the way, which gives this part of this thick filament, kind of looks like a golf club, a place to attach. So what they're showing here is how adenosine triphosphate comes in and locks that part of that thick filament, the myosin head, they call it. And that is going to cause the contraction, uh, the 
ability for this part to sort of hang on and grab a hold. And you can see here, it is now been used. So it is no longer ATP, it is no longer adenosine triphosphate. The last bond has been broken, that inorganic phosphate has been released. And so now it is locked in this position, kind of like a, a mouse trap. When you get a mouse trap and you load it, you pull a, the lever back and you lock it into place and it's now under tension. It's kind of like that. So when that calcium comes along and moves the uh, tropomyosin out of the way, that allows that part to snap on and grab sort of like the trigger being hit on the mousetrap to pull, to contract. In order to reset, we have to bring ATP back in again. So adenosine triphosphate is actually needed in this case, not to set the trap or not to, not to spring the trap, but to set it. That's the relaxation part of uh, muscle contraction. So in order to grab onto something, it has to be set and ready to go. Once that calcium moves uh, tropomyosin out of the way, that myosin head can grab onto that thick filament and pull it. Let me see if there's, uh, her, no, that's not it. There we are, okay, this is what I was looking for. So if you can think of those little things that kind of look like golf clubs as people pulling, and you can see them attached to that blue thick filament, and then you can see the thin pink filaments, they're going to pull in the direction of the middle. So these thin filaments get pulled this way. These thin filaments get pulled this way towards the middle so that this Z disc, oops, this Z disc here is going to get pulled closer to the middle. This one gets pulled closer to the middle. So that whole area from Z disc to Z disc is going to become shorter. All of that happens with the start of a signal coming down a neuron in the form of an electrical current. When it gets to the end of that neuron, it activates calcium channels, which then causes the release of acetylcholine. Acetylcholine crosses that neuromuscular junction and binds to receptors. That allows sodium to come rushing into the cell, which is now a new electrical current across the cell, uh, muscle cell membrane. That is gonna cause the release of calcium from their storage sites inside of that muscle cell. It's gonna flood the inside of that. The calcium is going to, this one here, no, there's this one. The calcium is going to move uh, this other filament out of the way. So it allows the thick filament to reach up and grab on in other words, it's going to allow these guys to grab, a, get a grip and grab, and then they're going to pull into the direction of the center, which is going to cause that whole thin filament, the whole myofibril filament to get shorter, which causes the whole cell to become shorter, which causes the whole vascular to become shorter, which causes the whole muscle to become shorter. There is a couple of good videos. I don't know if they're in the lab that actually demonstrate this. Well, as best as they can in the form of animation, of course, uh, because I realized the first time you're learning some of this physiology, it can get kind of confusing. Uh, the big takeaway messages I want you to get from this is, first of all, a muscle doesn't usually do anything unless it's told to do something. And 
The thing that tells a muscle to do something is a nerve. And the signal that comes down the nerve is an electrical type signal. We just call it an action potential. It's just a fancy word for an electrical signal. That electrical signal then has to change into a chemical signal. So the chemical signal is then released from the end of that nerve and goes across a little space, which then binds to the receptors on the muscle cell membrane. When that happens, that changes, or that changes the membrane. Because it changes the membrane, that allows sodium to come rushing in. Sodium coming into that cell now creates a more positive charge on the inside of the cells compared to the outside. That creates an electrical current across the cell membrane. The fact that that sodium is in there is going to cause calcium to be released from a storage site that's already inside of the cell. And that calcium is then going to allow for those thick filaments to grab on and pull those thin filaments. And that causes the entire contraction to occur all at that very small, incredibly small uh, level. And this all occurs as fast as you can blink. Well, actually faster than you can blink, which is pretty amazing. So I certainly don't expect anyone to completely understand this the first 10 times you hear it, but the takeaways are really important. There is a signal that has to come down the nerve in the form of an electrical signal we call an action potential. It changes into a chemical signal. We call that a neurotransmitter. In this case, it's acetylcholine. And acetylcholine is going to then uh, bind to the receptors of the muscle, which changes the membrane, which allows sodium to come in. That is going to change the inside of the cell, which then causes the release of the calcium, which then causes the contractions to occur. And don't forget, we do have a cleanup guy called cholinesterase, or sometimes they'll call him acetylcholinesterase. And he's just going to do some recycling of that uh, neurotransmitter that we used. So you're definitely gonna to wanna to know that acetylcholine is the neurotransmitter. You definitely wanna know that the action potential is the electrical signal that comes down the nerve. We'll talk about that space later on. In this case, I call it the neuromuscular junction. Here they're calling it the synaptic cleft. We'll talk more about that a little bit later. I call it the neuromuscular junction just so that people know I'm specifically talking about neuron to muscle. but you have to understand the connection between nerves and muscles. Because if something interrupts that electrical signal down to the muscle, in other words, if the electrical signal doesn't get down to the muscle, then the muscle won't contract. So no matter how much you wanna move your, oh, not you, no matter how much a person wants to move their legs, if there is, a problem with that signal getting down to their muscle, then their muscles will not contract. That's what you'd see in someone who is paralyzed, for instance. There's no electrical signal getting to those muscles. So good stuff to know. Talk about that. Acetylcholine, 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 acetylcholine. We'll talk more about sodium as well, its role in all of this. And notice how I mentioned calcium a couple of times. Calcium is going to be uh, required to move into those neurons so that the electrical signal becomes a chemical signal. And then calcium is going to be required inside of the muscle cells in storage so that 
it can do its job when it gets the signal to. And yeah. So what that means is that the more muscle, the more muscle that a person has, the more calcium they're going to need. More muscle means more calcium. More calcium means they're going to have to store more calcium. If they store more calcium, where are they going to store it? They're going to store it in their bones. If they store it in their bones, their bones are going to be stronger. So if you want stronger bones, you have to create the need to store calcium there. And to create the need, all you have to do is increase the muscle mass. More muscle mass equals more need of calcium. More need for calcium means more storage for calcium. More storage for calcium means bones will store it. Stronger bones. This is why I preach to young women in their exercise routines to include some kind of um, training that is going to cause resistance, increase muscle mass, so that they can have their bodies automatically wanting to store more calcium. Because if your body doesn't need calcium, just taking more calcium supplements is not going to cause the body to store it. It's just going to pee it right back out again. go into that because then that'll take me into myoglobin that's just a good term to know myoglobin myo means muscle globin is protein so when we talk about hemoglobin we know that hemoglobin is the seat inside of red blood cells that holds on oxygen so myoglobin is going to be some kind of seat uh, where the muscle is going to hold on oxygen. We've talked about already how glucose can be formed, or no, can be stored, sorry, in uh, what we call glycogen. I said that glycogen is the quick storage form of glucose. So that's quick to store it, but quick to get it back again when we need it. If we need a backup in these muscles, we can utilize things called pyruvate. Uh, this will create this will create a waste product called lactic acid, which then needs to be uh, removed. Otherwise, a buildup of lactic acid is going to cause um, much well change in the uh, in the pH in the area, which is going to change the way the cells react, not to mention it's going to cause some pain. This is why we always say if you're exercising a lot, you definitely want to get some fluids, lots of water, because we want to flush away all that extra waste product and not have that buildup of lactic acid. So that's the quickest way of going through that. Okay. The motor unit is simply the place where the nerves, specifically the neurons, abut uh, the muscle fibers themselves. What they're showing here in this little slice, uh, there we go. The spinal cord, this is just a slice of it. Like if you took a spinal cord and put it down and chopped it up like you were chopping up carrots, uh, this is what a spinal cord would look like on the inside. There's white matter on the outside and the um, gray matter is sort of in an H shape on the inside of it. That's where we find uh, the dendrites and cell bodies of the neurons. But well, we haven't talked about that yet, so never mind. So information coming from the spinal cord is going to get sent out to 
group, different groups of neurons is what it's showing here, which is going to activate uh, the cells. In other words, it's going to send the signals to the cells that says, you know what, go ahead and contract now. But realize that the body is pretty smart the way it's set up. If there's going to be signals going out that says, okay, it's time to uh, contract now, it tells the muscle to contract. There has to be some sort of signal that comes back and, and says to the spinal cord that the muscle is contracting so that it doesn't just continue to send signals, for instance. And also, uh, if, the, if the muscle has to contract, so it has to have some incoming messages going to the spinal cord as well, pardon me, as well as the outgoing messages telling muscle to contract. I think it's 1015. I think we'll take a break right here. Are we, oh dang it, okay, not quite. I thought we were almost halfway through, we're pretty close. So we'll take a break right here. Let some of this sink in for a bit. Yeah. Because I realized that uh, muscle physiology is complicated, which is why I, I went over it three times, maybe four times, possibly five times. I get that it's difficult. And I know that the first time you see it, it looks really confusing. Uh, but I strongly suggest reading about it, watching the videos on it. And animated videos, there's a couple of good ones that really show you the, the overall view of uh, what is happening, because that's kind of what you need at this level. You need to understand that muscles have to be told to do something. They have to be told to contract. And the thing that tells them to contract, that's what the nerves do. And the signals travel down nerves as in the form of an electrical current. And you have to know that that's called an action potential because you'll hear that term so much. So that's a big part of it, uh, knowing, that, knowing that then the electrical signal gets converted into a chemical signal is really important because we'll see that happening again later today in the nervous system. And that the chemical signal is going to bind and have an effect uh, on some other cell. In this case, in this chapter, the muscle cell, uh, that's an important idea. and sodium's role. Yeah, sodium's role in being part of that electrical current, that electrical message. We will see that again later today with the nervous system. Uh, and then we'll kind of put some of that together to have it make some sense. So take a few moments, rest your brain, uh, but do take, you know, remember today, take some time to read about this and also make sure you find some good videos it's not one in the lab. Find some good videos on this, some of the animation videos, because that can help a lot as well. Yeah. All right. So let's take a bit of a break right now. I will pause this. On the way, just go ahead and ask, jump on in. If there's something you always wanted to know, but were afraid to ask. Or maybe you just realize it's right now. Hey, I need to know that. I'm going to actually allow you to read through some of these. These are basic uh, terminologies, basic vocabulary terms. And this is, again, just sort of showing how these muscles are going to, how these muscles are going to go from being longer to shorter. That's all. Atrophy, decrease in muscle mass. Uh, this is the result of a decrease in muscle cell size and or muscle cell number. Hypertrophy is just the opposite of that. Hypertrophy is um, increase in muscle cells, increase in muscle 
cell number, muscle cell size or muscle cell number. And isotonic and isometric are best described using these images. So you can see an isotonic type of exercise. This person is holding some sort of weighted material and they are moving it against resistance. And of course, in this case, resistance is gravity, but they are able to move uh, whatever that is, that little weighted ball. Whereas isometric, they are using resistance or utilizing resistance against something immovable. So in either case, actually, the muscle is still contracting. There's still contraction of the muscle that's occurring. But uh, in the isometric, you see it's, it's actually not going to be able to contract to its fullest amount. And you can still you can think of the same thing as if you're standing and pushing against a brick wall. You know, you're not going to be able to move the wall, but your muscles are still going to contract. So a combination of these types of muscle exercises actually help the muscle to strengthen and grow. One is not necessarily better than the other. Uh, instead, using a combination of the two actually helps. So if you're considering fitness of some sort, um, doing these things in combination helps to increase muscle cell mass and muscle cell number. Cardiac muscle not surprisingly, is found in the heart, hence the name cardiac. You see here that it is branched. These are branched muscle cells. And the reason for that is because it's going to communicate with the cells next to it very, very quickly. And the thing about muscles, uh, cardiac muscle cells is they don't have that intermediate where they, they don't need acetylcholine. They can respond directly to the electrical stimulus, that action potential, which is good because that eliminates one more thing that can go wrong. And of course, we don't want heart muscle cells to fail. So the takeaway of that, uh, these are branched muscle cells and they respond directly to the electrical stimuli. The smooth muscle, like I said, does not have the striations, the stripes going across it, which is why if you look at it under a microscope, it looks smooth as compared to the other ones. And smooth muscle is involuntary, just like the cardiac muscle. So you don't really think about moving stuff through your intestines. It's just automatically doing it. So you can see there are different ways that we describe muscle depending upon their shape. Um, you know. Some of them are somewhat intuitive, but overall, uh, I think it's more important not so much to know the shapes at these point, but we'll go right into the different types of muscle. So we're actually not gonna worry too much about this. There's gonna be some, some terminology that I want you to know. Like I talked about origin and assertion already. I'm not going to worry too much about that. One thing you'll notice with when it comes to skeletal muscle is that you often see it crossing a joint. So in this case, you can see the bicep muscle crossing the elbow joint and attaching to the radius. And when that muscle contracts, it's going to change uh, it's going to change the angle typically decreases the angle of a joint. It's a good image of the biceps brachii also because bicep meaning two, it has two places where it begins, two origins, uh, both actually happening up on the scapula. One of them is on the acromion. I think we talked about that already. All right, as I said before, we're gonna find muscles that uh, often do opposite of one another, which is important because, well, again, if you have your arm flexed in one position, you wanna be able to put it back into another position. We will talk about 
muscles that work together to do sort of the same things. And then we already talked about some of the muscles that stabilize stuff. So we're gonna move past this because I wanna get into some of these. All right, I talked about that already. You know, I thought they had a better picture of the facial muscles. So looking at some of these face, the muscles of the face and head here, uh, I want to go into a couple of these very, very quickly, just because it kind of makes sense. For instance, the ones right up in the front here, those are frontalis muscles. And they're called frontalis muscles because they sit right on top of the frontal bone. I'm going to raise the eyebrows. The obicularis oculi are the circular muscles around the eye that are going to cause you to squint. These have nothing to do with moving the eyeball. Those are totally separate muscles we'll talk about another time. Uh, there's a circular muscle you can kind of see around the lips called the obicularis oris. It's going to give you sort of the pucker up lips. There's an important one here on the neck called the sternocleidomastoid muscle. You see it has two places where it starts on the sternum and on the clavicle. And then it inserts on the mastoid process, that bony projection that you feel right behind your ear. So if you look at the name of it, sternocleidomastoid, has two places where it starts on the sternum and on the clavicle, inserts on the mastoid process. This is gonna turn your head towards the center and then down just a bit. This is sometimes called the prayer muscle because of the way it turns your head sort of down and like you're looking down just a little bit. Um, let's see, what else? Oh, I didn't, I didn't talk about this one in the head, did I? The temporalis muscle. The temporalis muscle is called the temporalis muscle because it sits on top of the temporal bone. And it is one of the three main muscles involved in closing the mouth. The masseter, the medial pterygoid, and the temporalis. The lateral pterygoid is actually the main muscle involved in opening the mouth. So you have three main muscles that close the mouth, the masseter, the medial pterygoid, and the temporalis and one main muscle that opens the mouth, the lateral pterygoid. The reason for this is because you don't need a lot of strength just to open your mouth. Like if you're gonna bite an apple or if you're gonna chew a steak, but you definitely need the strength in chomping down on the apple or chewing up the, uh, the steak. So that's why we have more muscles that close the mouth than open the mouth. The trapezius muscle, you can see there coming up the neck. This is the muscle that shrugs the shoulders. So if you don't know the answer to the question, your trapezius muscles are the ones that are at work. And you shrug your shoulders like you don't know. Uh, let's see, the pectoralis major is the big main muscle of the chest. This is the one that's going to push things away from you or help push yourself up off the floor. It's called the pectoralis major because there is another muscle below it working in synergism called the pectoralis minor. Well, it kind of makes sense then. Uh, let's look at the shoulder muscle, the deltoid muscle. The deltoid muscle is the muscle that lifts the arm up and away from the body. This is one of our injection sites when we're going to give intramuscular injections. Uh, the deltoid muscle is one of the choices that we could inject into. Let me go down here. The biceps brachii, I talked about, that's the one that flexes the arm. 
as two places where it begins. Notice, in fact, as we go down the arm, let's look on the left arm. Notice the muscles that cause you to flex your fingers. In other words, to bend them down like you're making a fist. The muscles are actually found in your forearm. The tendons of the muscles run up your arm. They run underneath the retinaculum, that is this part right here, this band of tissue, and all the way to the tips of the fingers, which you can't see in this image. But all these tendons right here run all the way up to the tips of the fingers, except for this one. That's the palmaris longus. That's the only one that's not underneath the retinaculum. This is what we call God's bracelet. It's actually around the ankle as well. The retinaculum helps to keep all of those the tendons in place so they don't pop up. In fact, if you were to flex your wrist a little bit and touch the tip of your thumb to the tip of your pinky, you'll see this right here pop up. That's the palmaris longus. Kind of almost right in the middle of your wrist, it'll pop up. The reason it pops up is because it's not underneath that band of tissue we call the retinaculum. And the extensors um, are also located in the forearm. And they too go underneath the retinaculum and they're the ones that are going to straighten your fingers back out again. So back to these very, very quickly. These muscles that are going to flex your fingers. The tendons run across your palms underneath the palmaris longus. You can't see them there. And they each run to the tip of every finger. So the same way a person making a puppet hand would have a string that runs up all the way up to the finger. So when you pull on the strings, it causes the finger to bend downwards. That's exactly the way we are set up here interesting. Uh, let's look at the abdomen for just a moment. First thing you see the white sheet, they cut it in half here. It's not, this isn't the best uh, image to start with, but you have to sort of imagine it uh, going across the entire abdomen. The linea alba is the line, that's not what I'm talking about. The whole flat sheet that would go on both sides is what we talked about before called the aponeurosis, that that band of flattened like tendons that allow for attachment sites for muscles. The external abdominal oblique muscles, external, because they're towards the outside, the ones here, abdominal, because well, they're in the abdomen, and oblique, because they run at a diagonal. In this case, they go diagonally downwards. If you were to peel them backwards, right underneath them, what you would find are internal abdominal oblique muscles, which actually also at an angle, but they run kind of upwards. So the angles are opposite. And then these are kind of important right in the middle, the rectus abdominis. The rectus abdominis are kind of important because, well, they go straight up and down. And one thing you could take away from this is the word rectus. Rectus is a Latin word that means straight. So that's kind of important. We'll see that a lot. Rectus is a Latin word that means straight. So in this case, these are muscles that run straight up and down, rectus abdominis. Rectus are the straight muscles. And again, I'm not covering all the muscles, I'm just sort of going over some of the major ones. 
Okay, uh, let's see. The thigh, the anterior thigh, is actually made up of four muscles. The big main one right in the, right in the middle here almost is the rectus femoris. Rectus because it's straight and it runs right along the femur. Rectus femoris, straight along the femur. Then there's three other muscles called the vastus muscles. Vastus lateralis, vastus medialis, and vastus intermedius, which I do not see. For this particular level, uh, I would say you don't necessarily need to know the names of the individual muscles. We call them collectively the quadriceps muscles in the group of the muscles of the quadriceps. However, uh, the vastus lateralis muscle is the muscle where we give injections. Let's see, pediatric, there we go. That was a good one. Pediatric vaccinations. So if you have a young child and you brought them in to get their vaccines, uh, you'll notice they get one, two, three, four, five, typically. Uh, and they get them in the leg, they get them in the thigh. Those are intramuscular injections and they're injecting into the vastus lateralis muscle. Technically, we usually give uh, epinephrine like in the EpiPen in there as well. It goes into the vastus lateralis is typically the muscle. The sartorius muscle is the longest muscle in the body especially if you're including uh, the tendons to it. Because most people say, well, the rectus femoris is the longest. Well, not really. Not if you're including the attached, the tendons. The sartorius muscle starts way up on the hip, goes across the leg and inserts just below the knee. Uh, sometimes called the tailor's muscle because when a tailor measures a man for pants, uh, they measure using a measuring tape from the hip down to almost that same area to get the diameter of the thigh. So the tape measure would kind of fall right on top of it. I don't know if anybody even uses that term anymore though. The sartorius muscle. It's going to be a great muscle involved if you're, use, if you're doing a, an Irish jig or playing hacky sack or soccer. It's not terribly strong, it doesn't have to be. It just has to lift that lower leg up and sort of medially, sort of towards the inside. But it will be very helpful if you are trying to climb a tree and you need to get your leg up to that next branch or trying to climb a rock face and getting your foot up to that next foothold. So it's helpful in that area. Let's look at a couple of these. Tibialis anterior, that's a good one. Tibialis anterior runs right along the tibia, right in front, anterior. Mm, the peroneus. The tibialis anterior and the peroneus sort of help give the ability of the foot to move either where you're tilting it in, inward or you're tilting it outward. We haven't really gone over some of those terms yet. So I probably shouldn't have mentioned that yet. The gastrocnemius, that's a good one. Uh, the calf muscles are made up of two muscles, the soleus and the gastrocnemius, the main let me go here so you can see it in the back a little bit better. The main one being the gastrocnemius. It's the main muscle of the calf. Now, the thing about the gastrocnemius is that it has gastro in it. And immediately you think, well, gastro means stomach. So someone made a mistake because that's a calf muscle. That has nothing to do with the stomach. Uh, and nemius, spelled with the C, C-N-E-M-I-U-S, means leg. So somehow 
gastrocnemius means a leg stomach, stomach of the leg. I don't know why. I think maybe they, they thought it looked like the stomach, uh, but that's what it means. So don't let that one confuse you. This is an important muscle if you want to stand on your tippy toes. It will plantar flex your foot. It will, you know, again, we haven't gone over these terms. It will cause, yeah, it will cause your heel to come up off the ground. So you're on your tippy toes. We call that plantar flexion. And you could see the tendon runs all the way down to that big heel bone called the calcaneus. This is called the Achilles tendon, named from Greek mythology. Achilles, who was half mortal, half not. His mother uh, wanted to protect him from the arrows of his enemies when he was born, so she dipped his body into the river Styx so the water would protect him. But she had to hold on to him somewhere, so she held on to him from this little tiny area right behind your heel. And so that water never touched that area. So that was his, uh, that was the point where he was vulnerable. And later on in war, or somebody, who was it? Paris of Troy shot an arrow and it, it hit him right there. Not to be confused with Paris of Hilton. Ended up killing him. Needless to say, I'm not going to ask you about Greek mythology. All right, let's go a little more to the back again. Let's see, we saw the sternocleidomastoid, we saw the trapezius, uh, we saw the deltoid. Infraspinatus. And the teres, these helping with the, we'll often refer to as the rotator cuff muscles. Actually, this isn't one of the slides too, so we'll go, we'll see that. Um, It'll list those. It'll list the uh, quadricep muscles as well. And I think of it. Uh, the, so we'll see those in a little bit. The triceps brachii. This is the muscle on the back of the arm, posterior aspect that's going to extend the arm. It works the opposite of the bicep brachii. The tismus dorsi, those large back muscles you're going to use to pull something down towards you or pull yourself up in a branch even help with rowing a boat. So some of those. Uh, gluteus maximus is the big butt muscle. It's called the gluteus maximus because there's a gluteus minimus as well. And there's actually a gluteus medius, which is kind of more on the side a little bit. And the gluteus medius is actually the muscle that we inject into when we're doing uh, intramuscular injections. That's the injection site. We don't inject into the gluteus maximus, we inject into the gluteus medius. The hamstring group are the group of thigh muscles in the back of the thigh. Uh, the quadriceps are the ones in the front made up of four. And the quadricep muscles are going to help you get up from a squatting position or assist in um, running, uh, extending the leg, excuse me. The hamstring group these are going to be flexing the leg, and there's three of them, the semi-tendinous, uh, semi-membranous, and the um, biceps femoris. Oh, there it is, okay, the biceps femoris. We didn't talk too much about abduction and adduction yet, so I'm gonna add those. I think those are some good ones. Oh, I didn't include the zygomaticus uh, major. That was a good one too. Okay. Of these, I talked about the orbicularis oculi. I talked about those. Um, orbicularis oris. Orbicularis oris making the kissing. Uh, Buccinator is more about um, drinking a thick milkshake through a straw, kind of like that. 
Zygomaticus major causes the corners of the mouth to come upward, like you'd see in laughing. Good one to include. The masseter, the temporalis, and actually it's the medial pterygoid. The medial pterygoid closes the mouth. The pterygoids don't, open, not both of them. I don't know why it says that. Uh, the, the lateral pterygoid opens the mouth. The medial pterygoid actually is involved in closing the mouth because there's three main muscles involved in chewing and uh, in closing the mouth when you chew. The masseter, the temporalis, and the medial pterygoid. Notice pterygoid is spelled with a P. So good thing to remember when you're coming across some of these terms and you see, uh, uh, you see words that have a P and then a T, like, like uh, pneumonia. Pneumonia is spelled with a P and then an N. So the P is silent, it's pronounced pterygoid. Masseter, temporalis, and medial pterygoid, those close the mouth. It's only the lateral pterygoid that opens. I've talked about the buccinator already. Oh, okay, I did talk about the sternocleidomastoid, the prayer muscle. It's gonna turn the head towards the center and down just a little bit. I didn't talk about the spinous capitis. Talked about the trapezius and shrugging the shoulders. I didn't talk about the intercostals. The intercostals are important. Yeah, I wanna include those. The intercostals, these are actually delicious. If you slow cook these and cover them in barbecue sauce, they are absolutely delicious. Uh, these are the muscles found in between the ribs. Because of course, when you order ribs in a restaurant and you're not gonna eat the rib, the rib's the bone, you're gonna eat the meat in between. Well, that's, that's what meat is. Meat is made up of muscle. So these muscles that are between the ribs uh, help in breathing, depending upon where they're located. The intercostal muscles are gonna help with breathing. For instance, um, they can bring the ribs together to help decrease the size of the thoracic cavity and actually expel more air, forcefully expel air. That's why if you've been coughing because you had a cold, and you've been coughing for two or three days straight, your chest hurts. And the doctor says, oh, that's skeletal muscle pain. Meaning you've been using these muscles uh, to contract and pull these ribs closer together and decrease the size of the thoracic cavity to cough, to forcefully expel air. So you just overworked muscles. The diaphragm is that dome-shaped muscle in the uh, separating the thoracic cavity from the abdominal cavity. And as it contracts, it flattens out, not completely, it just becomes less dome shaped. But that's gonna cause air to come rushing into the lungs. That's how we breathe. So it's important that the diaphragm uh, gets those messages. The diaphragm is skeletal muscle. And if you remember earlier, I talked how skeletal muscle is, vol is voluntary, but the other muscle that I said was involuntary is stuff that we don't have to think about, like our heart beating or things moving through our intestines. So how can this be skeletal muscle if it is involuntary, because we don't think about breathing. Well, we do have some control over it. Like you can, you can hold your breath if you wanted to. Uh, you could take a deep breath if you wanted to. You can take shallow breaths. So it is actually skeletal muscle. That one has caused confusion in the past. All right, I talked about the internal and external obliques. Uh, I didn't mention the transverse abdominis. We have. We have muscle going in all these different directions. I mentioned the rectus abdominis. That one was one that I wanted you to know about simply because the word rectus means straight. So anytime you see rectus, that means straight. So if you'll notice, all of us have a six pack. 
every one of us already have it there. Um, sometimes it just gets covered up by donuts a little bit, but that muscle already exists there. It's just a matter of building it up and getting rid of the extra lining of subcutaneous tissue on top of it. Especially for swim costume season. Oh wait, did it show the, oh yeah. You can see a little bit of the intercostal muscles here between the ribs as well. That's kind of good to see. The erector spinae muscles, uh, these help the back flexing and moving. And where, there we are. Come back to that in just a moment. We'll come back to these in just a moment. I thought that, oh, here it is, okay. These are the ones I was talking about before. You'll hear people use the term rotator cuff, meaning the, the muscles around the shoulder. Now, the reason why I'm kind of pointing this out, remember the bone of the upper arm, the humerus, has that rounded ball shape to it, and the uh, scapula has that indented cup shape area. And they go together to make this ball and socket joint. And consider how much range of motion your arm has. You know, you can move your arm straight out to your side and lift it up parallel to your body, like sort of in a straight line. You can lift it in front of you, parallel to your body. You can spin it like a windmill. And the reason for that is because of all these different muscles that kind of work together. The rotator cuff is made up of these four infra and supraspinatus muscles, subscapularis and the teres minor. The deltoid muscle isn't technically part of the rotator cuff muscles, but it absolutely functions in helping to make these uh, other muscles work. So it in and of itself is not included under the rotator cuff muscles, but if it was up to me, um, I would also, I would sort of put it in there as well because it adds to that ability for the uh, other four to work. So now let's go back and see if we can see an area we can see the, oh, you can see the teres minor and the subscapularis. They don't have the infraspinatus or supraspinatus there. No. All right, well, those, those were a couple that I kind of wanted you to know about. Hmm. The pelvic floor. So when you look at the pelvis, the bony pelvis by itself, uh, you can see there's sort of an opening there. And we know that the baby is going to come through that area uh, in, in pregnancy or in labor and delivery. But we have to do something to create a, a strong bottom to that area. And the coccygeus and the levator ani actually make up a bunch of that muscular structure that helps to uh, create that floor of the pelvis. And the one in females, uh, the bulbospongiosis muscle, that one becomes important when we're talking about labor and delivery. And especially if we expect some tearing is going to occur. If we expect that tearing will occur, then we are going to direct the tear. Uh, this is a cut or an incision uh, called an episiotomy. It's not always done with, this, usually just done with scissors, not so much with a scalpel. But people think that that is something that is done so the, the tissue doesn't tear. Uh, no, it's okay if it tears. In fact, the tear will heal better than the incision or cut will. However, we don't want it to tear out of control. And we'll talk about that a little bit later on. So we wanna to direct to the tear. And one of the muscles that gets cut through is the bulbospongiosis muscle. 
And so that is the first repair that is made when after the baby and placenta are delivered and we have to sew all this area up. And the reason it's important to notice, note this one is because that's the repair that's gonna give the most strength because uh, it's the deepest and the thickest. And when you repair that, the skin just sort of comes together pretty naturally. And so when you get to finally get to the repairing just the outer layer of the skin, um, sometimes those sutures can come out like a little prematurely. And women think that that somehow is going to cause them to tear in half. No, the, the real strength is those inner um, repairs of the bulbospongiosis. Bulbo so that's when you'll hear that come up. When you guys get into labor and delivery and they talk about having to do an episiotomy, you'll hear about the bulbospongiosis, most likely hear about the bulbospongiosis muscle. Uh, we'll talk about the urethral sphincters a little bit later, as well as the, ex the anal sphincters. There's two anal sphincters, internal and external, of course. I thought there's an external, there's obviously an internal. Okay. Talked about some of these. I didn't talk about these terms, and I, I they probably should have put these terms in a little bit earlier. So when we got to the muscles, you would understand what these terms mean. Uh, abduction and adduction, or abduct and adduct. A, B, D, U, C, T, and A, D, D, U, C, T. Uh, adduction is gonna be moving more towards the midline. So when you see these, uh, the rhomboid muscles here that are going to adduct you know that they're going to move something more towards the midline of the body. Whereas I think we saw some abduction muscles on the thigh or maybe between the fingers, they're gonna move things away from the midline. Like here, the deltoid, and we saw it. Abduction is gonna move it away from the midline. And that kind of makes sense. Actually, if you think of the word abductor abduction you heard of a, a child being abducted they were taken away adduction is bringing them together adduction a d d a d a deduction bringing them together okay so like i said i think we hit some of the major muscles which is kind of what i wanted to go over because there's no way to go through all the muscles. That would just be a lot. We didn't really hit any muscles of the um, forearm. The brachioradialis is a big muscle of the forearm. It kind of allows the wrist to be twisted sort of back towards you. So like if you're uh, maybe popping open a soda can or drinking something, I suppose, in that direction. But it's one of the largest muscles of the forearm. That's a good way to remember it. The brachialis is, is gonna work in synergism with the bicep brachii to um, flex the arm. Here is a good Example, you can see the biceps brachii coming up and attaching to the uh, scapula. And here, I apologize, the coracoid process where it attaches at the acromion, the coracoid process. And there is a groove on the humerus. If you look at that bone by itself, you'll see this deep groove running up right up to the head of the humerus. And that is where that tendon from the uh, long head of the bicep brachii yeah, kind of runs up through it. So as I said before, all those little extensions, projections, parts of the bones, there's a reason they all exist. There's a reason they're there.
the opponent's pole assist is actually uh, part of the thenar muscles. There's a group of muscles in your thumb, like right in the base of your palm. You can feel sort of this pad of muscles right there that actually helps bring your thumb across. And collectively, we call them the thenar muscles. And it's probably better to know that name rather than in any individual names. Um, because there's a, there's a pad on the opposite side of your hand, on the palm side of your pinky, called the hypothenars. But the thenar muscles are the, the big pad of muscles at the base of your thumb. And they're easy to remember because if you think of the word thenar, you just think of your thumb. You think of thenar, think of your thumb. Thenar, think thumb. Thenar, think thumb. This gets clinically important later on when we see patients who have carpal tunnel syndrome. You may have heard of this before. Carpal tunnel syndrome is a compression of nerves, especially the medial nerve, that runs up through the wrist. And one of the things that innervates is the muscles of the, or the thenar muscles of the thumb. So if that muscle is getting impinged, then that muscle group actually will start to lose some of its bulk. It'll kind of flatten out. We call it thenar wasting. And because carpal tunnel syndrome is so prevalent in people working on computers or people working with hair, you see a lot of carpal tunnel syndrome, you'll hear a lot about thenar wasting. So the thenars are the muscles in that palm, in the uh, base of your thumb, in that pad that is in the base of your thumb. That's why I like to include that because now you'll hear about that. Okay. Notice this adductor, adductor, adductor. These muscles are going to pull the leg in towards the midline of the body. Abductors will pull it away. So they'll like spread your legs away from the, the midline of the body. The adductors will pull the legs inward. Okay, I don't wanna go into too much more there. Oh, they do include the gluteus medius. You can barely see it though. Uh, that is on the hip. That is where we are giving injections. Extensor digitorum longus, extending the digits. And it is a long muscle. Gastrocnemius talked about that with the calcaneus. Yeah. Where are we on time? Okay. Oh. All right, we should be about good then. That gives us an hour and you know. All right, that should be an hour. Yeah. Let's start at the top. Uh, temporalis. One of three main muscles.
closing the mouth, along with the masseter. And medial, oops, pterygoid, um, yeah, because they're all, all these are all, including the lateral pterygoid, they're all innervated by the same nerve, the trigeminal nerve um, innervates all of them. Okay, let's see what's the next one I'd want you to know about. Uh, sternocleidomastoid. Turns head to center. Bends downward. Prayer muscle. Trapezius. Shrug shoulders. Deltoid. Abduct's arm. Injects in sight. We talked about the biceps and the triceps, brachii, flexing and extending the arm. Pectoralis major. Big chest muscle. That's a BIG chest muscle. Rectus abdominis. Rectus means straight. Oh, we did talk about the thenar. Thenar muscles. Thumb. Thenar, think thumb. I'm trying to include muscles that have uh, relevance, things that you're going to hear about. Gluteus muscles, gluteus medius, injection site. Quadriceps. Let's see, do I want you to know the quadriceps? Yeah. 
rectus femoris, and then three vastus muscles, and the vastus lateralis is an injection site. Gastrocnemius, big calf muscle. Um, plantar flexes, tippy toes. three hamstring muscles, hamstring, biceps femoris, semitendinous, semimembranous. back of thigh. Again, I don't really know if it would be worth uh, memorizing um, the biceps for more semi-tendinous, semi-membranous, but the back of thigh. If you just remember the hamstrings are the ones in the back, quadriceps are the ones in the front. It's an eye, quadriceps. Um, Okay. I think those are the major ones. Let's see, frontalis, temporalis, orbicularis oculi, orbicularis oris now, buxander now, sternocleidomastoid, yes, trapezius, yes, deltoid, yes. Talked about biceps, triceps, brachioradialis, no. Uh, inner muscles, yes. Uh, intercostal. Between the ribs. Delicious. Pectoralis major, pectoralis minor, uh, external abdominal obliques, internal abdominal obliques, rectus abdominis, transverse abdominis, the aponeuroses, I mentioned that. Iliopsoas, no, I didn't do the iliopsoas, don't worry about that one. Um, bulbous spongiosis, I talked about that one. More so because I think you're going to hear about it later on. So that's why I brought it up now. I'm not really going to test you on the bulbous spongiosis muscle, but I have a feeling you're probably going to hear about it later on. So I want you to hear just at least have heard it, nothing else. Uh, Leviator, levator, uh, ani, coccygeus. I talked about those making up the floor of the pelvis. I think those are the main muscle groups that I main muscles or main muscle groups that I want you to know. I pointed out the rotator, uh, infraspinatus, supraspinatus, teres minor, pointed out the rhomboids, I think. Yeah, I did. All right. There we are. So at least now you know, as I've gone through the list here, I, I wanted you to kind of see the ones. Oh, did I mention the sartorius? Yeah, the Taylor's muscle. Yeah, long muscle. Longest muscle. Because it goes from the pelvis all the way down below the knee. 
Okay. So that way, if you've heard me say them, if I've written them down, um, now you have an idea of the ones that I'm gonna ask about. Especially if I've written them down here. Yeah. Again, I'm trying to choose, uh, I always try to choose some of the main muscles and some of the ones are gonna have clinical significance. <clears throat> Sometimes it's because that injury in and of itself, that, no, that injury, that muscle in and of itself is prone to an injury of some kind, or maybe there's something unique about the muscle or the nerve that innervates them, like the uh, trigeminal nerve that innervates the masseter, the medial pterygoid, the lateral pterygoid, and the, and the um, temporalis. That, that becomes clinically significant in a condition we'll see, we might see later on, maybe not, called uh, Tic de la Rue or trigeminal neuralgia, or sometimes called the suicide disease because this chronic pain that kind of goes down along the face, along the jawline uh, can be so severe. People just want to kill themselves. Pretty serious. So, so in that case, I kind of want you to know the names of those, not just because they're the ones that close the mouth or open the mouth, but because they all get innervated by the same nerve. And that nerve has some clinical significance in diseases that you might end up hearing about later on, probably end up hearing about later on. So, that's why I've chosen the ones that I have. Uh, that does not mean that you shouldn't know a lot of the muscles, uh, but you definitely want to know the ones that I'm going to expect you to know. All right. I would think that you would say, well, which ones do we need to know for the test? That's what I would want to know. So if I wrote them down there, then you're probably, going to, those are definitely ones that I would imagine putting on the exam. Are we doing it through exam soft? No, because for some reason, my stuff doesn't go through exam soft. So I'll, I'll put it in Canvas. It's just like a quiz. Okay. So it'll show up that oh. same way. So we're going to take the exam on Canvas? Yeah. Same way you take the quiz. All right, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know why that is, but that's that's what I was told that this class does all this, all the exams and the quizzes and everything are supposed to go through Canvas. And as you can see, the quizzes are had already been there. Um, so I'm just gonna replace the, the exam that is there with one of my own. And again, it's going to be off material that we went over. And I'll make sure that you have some kind of review, some kind of a review for it at least. So that you don't go in completely blind. Okay. I think that is all for now. I think I want to take a break. Then we'll come back and we will start neurology and that will be important stuff there's a lot of good stuff in neurology uh i kind of i i enjoy teaching neurology it, it's pretty neat but it is it does get complicated so i'll try and keep it as simple as possible it's pretty cool stuff though it's pretty amazing so let's do that let's take a break 11.40, let me pause our recording. Mm. We're back, yes, yes. Yes, we're here. Yes, you are here, I am here as well.
Okay. We are going to jump right in as, uh, unless someone has questions now about brain. A little bit that we went over. No, all right. Okay. Let's get started then. I think we have to start with chapter 11. So you should be able to see my screen right about now. Cells of the nervous system. Yep, you can see it. All right. The nervous system helps to regulate what happens in the body moment to moment, as well as some long-term things, but uh, it makes decisions. You know, nervous tissue can do that. It can store information. It can interpret information or interpret data. It can send messages. It can, in either direction, uh, in other words, incoming message or ongoing messages. And it does it at lightning speed. So why does it include the endocrine system functioning as a communication uh, pathway of the body? Well, because the endocrine system also helps to do that, manage moment to moment as well as long-term changes in the body. The difference is how they do it. The nervous system sends information very, very quickly. And then if it, for instance, if it says to do something, it says to contract a muscle, for instance, it sends that information quickly. The muscle gets the information quickly. It follows that instruction quickly, and then it's over. And if you want the effect to last longer, you have to send another message, and then another one, and another one, and another one. The endocrine system also sends messages, except it does not send them at lightning speed. It sends messages in the blood in the form of hormones. That's what a hormone is, is a chemical message and it's gonna cause some change to occur somewhere. The difference is the change tends to be somewhat long, longer lasting with the uh, chemical message of the endocrine system. So that's how these two sort of function together. And this is a very complicated diagram of exactly how that happens. What it's showing in the yellow block is the central nervous system, which is basically the brain and the spinal cord. And then beneath that, the peripheral nervous system, which includes all of the nerves that branch off of the brain and branch off of the spinal cord and branch off of those branches, which branch off of those branches and branch off of those branches. And the the peripheral nervous system is typically considered uh, the breakdown between the somatic and the autonomic systems is where it really happens. The somatic is under voluntary control. The somatic portion of the nervous system does things if you want them to do it. If you want to move your leg, for instance. The autonomic nervous system does things automatically, things you don't have to think about, like breathing or heart rate. So 
So the stuff that we do, the stuff that we've been doing all morning long, you haven't even thought about, uh, that is under autonomic control. And then the autonomic nervous system is further subdivided into sympathetic and parasympathetic divisions. Parasympathetic divisions, uh, these, this is what we run on most of the time. This is stuff that uh, boring day-to-day -day how these things are going to operate, those automatic things. It only switches to sympathetic uh, pathway when there is some, some sort of threat, danger, or a need uh, to increase um, the rate of things happening in the body. For instance, if we are sitting at home with our significant other on the sofa, watching a DVD, eating pizza, relaxing, um, our heart rate is low, our respiratory rate is low, our pupils are constricted, they're, they're focused just on what's on the TV, uh, our digestive system is processing the pizza. And then suddenly, there's black smoke starts rolling out from underneath the bedroom door and the smoke alarms go off. Then our autonomic nervous system switches into sympathetic control. It's going to change the way we react because we have to um, make quick decisions in order to survive. So our heart rate is going to change, it will increase. Our respiratory rate will therefore increase because we're going to be pumping blood around more. We're gonna need more oxygen. Our blood is going to no longer be concerned with digestive system. So the body's gonna shunt the blood to the muscles because we're gonna to have to grab our things and run. Our pupils are gonna dilate because we're gonna to wanna to get as much information uh, into our brain as possible. This is why they call the sympathetic division the fight or flight because you either have to put up a fight or run away. Parasympathetic division, we usually refer to as rest and digest. Although the reality is most of our life, we are under parasympathetic uh, control, the autonomic nervous system. Because most of our life, we're not in those types of environments. Now, It doesn't have to be that drastic. It doesn't have to be a fire or being chased by a bear. It could just be you're driving home and uh, you want to get home quickly and you sort of skirt through a stop sign and then those police lights come on behind you. And you think, oh great, is my, do I have my insurance card? Did I pay my insurance? Uh, and of course, your body switches over into fight or flight. So anytime you're under stress is when you're switching over to the sympathetic division. Notice the terminology here that's in the parentheses, afferent, efferent, afferent, efferent. As an FYI, because we'll see these in other things as well, afferent means coming in, efferent means going away. So there'll be a times where we'll see different blood vessels that we'll refer to as afferent arterioles versus efferent arterioles, taking blood in or taking blood away. So in this, in this uh, situation, they're taking information in the afferent and moving information out the efferent. So an example would be, uh, you touch something hot. You didn't realize the stove was on next to you and you put your hand down on it. The afferent signals 
are going to go up your arm, from your fingertip, up your arm, to your spinal cord. And your spinal cord is going to take this information and make a decision. It will decide that there is something that is going to cause damage to our tissue if we don't move that stuff away. So it will then send an efferent signal out to the muscles of the fingers and the arm, maybe even that side of the body, which will say contract those muscles away. And of course, then the signal will go up to the brain. By the time it gets up to the brain, you've already jumped away. And now you're looking at your fingertip and looking at the stove wondering what just happened. It takes a little bit, of, it takes an extra second to get that to the brain and process it. So the efferent signals are the ones going out to the muscles saying contract, contract, contract. They're going to make an effect. They're going to affect something. That sense. The central nervous system is pretty simple. Brain and spinal cord. Simple in definition, at least. Not simple in what they do. Again, takes information coming in. Processes the information, stores information, makes a decision on the information, and then sends information out to do something. So the peripheral nervous system are all those nerves that branch off of the brain or that branch off of the spinal cord. And then of course, the branches that come off of those branches. Good definitions to know, just in general. Afferent versus efferent, incoming versus outgoing. So like I said, it's gonna show up in other types. All right, so I talked about somatic, talked about autonomic, sympathetic is the fight or flight, parasympathetic is the rest and digest. We have, we have several different uh, types of cells that make up the nervous system. The main one, the main cell of the nervous system, what we refer to as the parenchyma, is what we call the neuron. The neuron is the main cell of the nervous system. It does what you think of when you think of the nervous system doing things. However, it gets a lot of help from these assisting cells. They are called the neuroglia cells. Glia, glia means glue. So these cells help, I don't wanna to say to hold together because it's not really true. Sort of like when you say your, your grandmother is the glue that holds your family together. She isn't actually sticking to everyone. She's just the one that people go to, the one they depend on, the one that um, has advice and can help out and help do things maybe. So when we talk about the neuroglia cells being like glue, they're not actually sticking neurons together, but they are assisting the neurons in doing their job. Let me show you the astrocytes. This is one type of neuroglia cell. Now, understand that the brain is eh, delicate. Those neurons are delicate. So the blood doesn't interact directly uh, with the neurons. In fact, it's going to have a barrier so that not everything in the blood can actually interact with the neurons. We call that the blood-brain barrier. And that blood-brain barrier
is made up of cells called astrocytes. These are cells that have radiating branches. which makes me think of a star. And because it makes up this barrier, a barrier reminds me of a fence. So what we have is we have a fence made up of astrocytes. And in fact, even kind of looks like the letter A right here, astrocytes. And what do they do? They separate the blood From the brain. So that's how I always remember astrocytes, these neuroglia cells. They make up the blood brain barrier. They remind me of these cells that make up a fence shaped like stars because they have radiating branches and it separates the blood from the brain, it makes up the blood brain barrier. One way you can always tell when things like medications certain medications can cross over if meds can cross over then they usually cause drowsiness that's drowsiness so think of a medication like diphenhydramine or diphenhydramine. Diphenhydramine is the active ingredient in Benadryl. We know that Benadryl crosses the blood brain barrier because it definitely causes drowsiness. But that's how I remember astrocytes. Astrocytes make up the blood brain barrier. Microglia cells, these are phagocytes. They go around gobbling things up, cleaning up garbage. Ependymal cells, these are found in empty spaces. We actually have some empty spaces in our brain and they're lined with ependymal cells that make a fluid called cerebrospinal fluid. And it's the cerebrospinal fluid that circulates around the brain and spinal cord. But what do these other two cells do? Oligodendroglia cells and Schwann cells. Oligodendroglia cells and Schwann cells basically do the same thing. They make up insulation that wraps around part of the neuron. We call it myelin. And you can see here with this oligodendroglioocyte, oligodendroglio cell or oligodendroglioocyte, you can see how part of this one oligodendrogliocyte wraps itself around part of this neuron, part of this neuron, part of this neuron, and it creates what we call a myelin sheath. It acts like insulation. The Schwann cell does the same thing. The only difference is the Schwann cell wraps its entire self around uh, the neuron creating the myelin insulation. So they do it in slightly different ways, but they do basically the same thing. 
There is a, another big difference between the two, however, and that is where they do their job. Oligodendoglia cells do their job in the central nervous system. Schwann cells do their job in the peripheral nervous system. So if you can remember that they both make the insulation, the myelin around the neurons, they just do it in a slightly different way. Then, all, then the other thing you have to remember is where. So I would always suggest just getting a note card and writing a oligodendrogliocyte or oligodendrogliocyte or on one side of a note card and central nervous system on the other, and then getting another note card and writing Schwann cell on one side of the note card and peripheral nervous system on the other. So even if I didn't completely understand what they did, I at least know where they did it, where they do their job. So let's look at a neuron. Uh, we're going to disregard this axon collateral for just a moment. And we'll keep it as simple as possible. Now, you can say it kind of looks like a weird palm tree. Yeah, I get that. Kind of a weird palm tree. Here is the body of the neuron. And you can see that is where we'd find the nucleus. The body is sometimes called the soma, or they call it here. Okay, they say about cell body or soma. And you'll notice that there are these branches that come off of it called dendrites. Dendrite. Then there is a long part of it called the axon. This large branch that comes down and ends in the synaptic knobs, also called uh, synaptic boutons, also called the end of the neuron, and probably a few other names. You'll also notice there is the myelin sheath, the insulation that is around the axon. In this case, it is the Schwann cells. So this is a peripheral nerve. And there are spaces in between called the nodes of Ron VA. So what does all this mean? Okay, let's start out simply. Here we have the end of the neuron, the bouton. Here we have the dendrites. of a neuron. Again, I'm gonna keep it as simple as possible here. Here's the body. That's of course where we're gonna find the nucleus. The long part is the axon. And there is myelin insulation, swan cells or oligodendroglia cells sort of wrapped around here, little spaces in between the nodes of Ron VA. And then I'll put it maybe here. I have another neuron over here. 17 years of art school. Which one, let me get this down pat. And of course, we'll put some insulation around this one as well. Okay. 
So here's what happens. An electrical signal comes down this neuron at lightning speed. Of course, we call that an action potential. It gets to the end of that neuron. Oh, I hope that's not, okay. Gets to the end of that neuron and it is going to release a neurotransmitter across this space, which is called the synapse or synaptic gap or synaptic cleft. It goes through that same process of coming down as an electrical current, which then is gonna to have to change into a chemical signal. So there's gonna to have to be calcium channels that are going to have to open up to allow calcium to come in. These neurotransmitters are going to bind to the receptors on the dendrites. That is going to cause a change in the membrane, which is going to cause sodium to come rushing in, which now turns it back into an electrical signal. That electrical signal goes to the body of the neuron for interpretation. What should we do with this? What do we do with this electrical signal? Do we disregard it? Do we hang on to it? Or do we send it on to the next one? If it decides to send it on, then that electrical signal goes from the body down to the axon hillock, which then goes to the axon. Dang it. And that signal, the electrical signal leapfrogs down here again, as an action potential, gets to the end of this neuron, where it is once again converted back into a chemical signal, which goes across this space, binds to receptors on the dendrites of the next neuron. That causes a change in the permeability of the membrane. Sodium comes rushing in, that changes it back into an electrical signal and the whole process starts again. So we have a signal that is an electrical signal that travels down the axon of a neuron, gets to the end of the axon. Calcium channels are activated that causes the release of a neurotransmitter. The neurotransmitter goes across the synaptic gap or synaptic cleft, the synapse, binds to receptors on the dendrites of the next neuron. That is the, yes? No, okay. That is the chemical signal that is now gonna change back into an electrical signal because as that neurotransmitter binds to receptors, that's gonna change the permeability of the membrane that's gonna cause sodium to come rushing in. That is going to then change back to an electrical current inside the neuron, which then is gonna get interpreted, decide what to do with it. Then it sends it down the rest of the axon to the very end where it is changed back into a neurotransmitter uh, released across that synaptic gap and binds to receptors of the next neuron. That's it. That's how your brain works. That's it. Electrical signal becomes a chemical signal, becomes an electrical signal, becomes a chemical signal, becomes an electrical signal. But that's all there is to it. Simple. Problem is, how does that become that image in your head of the pink elephant wearing a purple cowboy hat walking across the Walmart parking lot? Or the answer to the question, how much is nine plus five? How does an electrical signal become a chemical signal, become an electrical signal? How is that suddenly the way you feel when you're with somebody you really, really like? Or when you have to listen to my lectures? <laughs> Hopefully that's a good electrical signal to a chemical signal to an electrical signal. We don't know. <clears throat> Great question. Don't know. It's a good one. It's good. It is good. 
So this is basically what your brain is made up of, whole bunches of these. And there are variations to their shapes and things. You saw I, I disregarded the one collateral, for instance, in that image. I tried to keep it as simple as possible. But there are multiple variations to the neurons, but they all basically do the same thing. Now, how does that make a nerve? Because a nerve is nothing but a whole bunch of neurons all strung together. So this, this will be my um, schematic. Oops, I should do it. No, sorry. This will be my schematic of the neuron. Right? Because you can kind of see how this area would be the body and then the axon and then the end of it. And then I'll put another neuron here and another neuron, oops, another neuron here, etc. So the signaling will basically be an electrical signaling, except for that little interruption where it's a chemical, but it basically goes in this direction. So you can think of a nerve as a bunch of neurons just sort of strung in one direction. But nerves can be kind of big. So you can kind of, instead of having individual one, two, three different neurons here, I'll just draw it as a straight line like this. So we can have a straight line of neurons connected like this. And then I can get another straight line of neurons and I can weave it together. And then another one and weave it together. And now it starts to get a little bit thicker. But the fun thing is I can even get neurons that go in the opposite direction and weave them in here too. So some nerves will have strings of neuron just going in one direction. Some will just be strings of neurons going in the other direction. And some nerves will have strings of neurons that take messages in either direction. And then you could consider the spinal cord as just big groups of these long twisted strings of nerves. And then they can have branches that come off of them that send messages out this way. And other branches that bring messages in this way. Sending messages basically up to the brain or out to the rest of the body. So you can imagine if one of these had a severe injury right here and got cut. So information can still be coming in from uh, this area here and above, but no information from any of these areas below that line will be coming into the spinal cord or into the brain. And we can certainly have information going out this way, but anything below that cut, there's gonna be no signaling set. So if those said these were supposed to be sending signals to muscles to contract, well, those muscles aren't gonna contract anymore. And again, this is how paralysis can occur. Dr. Surgeon. Yes. Can I ask a question? Sure. Well, oh, my father, he's been having problem with his sciatic nerve. So what kind of signal is that sending? Because usually when he says it hurts, um, it comes to a point where he can't walk. Um, and then he feels the pain up in his back area and his lower leg area. Yes. The sciatic nerve is a huge nerve. It branches off uh, right at that level of L4, L5, and L5, S1, coming from the um, spinal cord. 
So if you remember where the, the vertebrae, remember there are seven cervical vertebrae, 12 thoracic vertebrae, five lumbar vertebrae, and then you get to the sacrum. Mm -hmm. Well, this is a big branch right where that lumbar vertebrae number five meets the sacrum. It's a big branch and it comes off the leg, or comes off of the spinal cord and goes down like the pelvis, like almost in the middle of the butt, down the leg, splits off like right where the almost right where the knee is, the, the bend in the knee, and goes down and innervates uh, the ankle and the foot. So where does this numbness, tingling pain come from? It actually originates way back up in that lower back region because of something like a herniated disc or a bulging disc pressing out on that nerve or causing injury to that nerve is going to create an inflammatory process, which is going to be followed by swelling, which is gonna compress on that nerve, which is gonna interrupt that signaling That would be coming up this way, as well as going down this way, and the blood supply to that nerve. So oftentimes, when that nerve gets compressed, it's going to sort of send mixed signals back up this way, like something is wrong, which is interpreted as things like pain. And then when blood supply goes uh, is taken away for a bit and it goes back to it, that creates a signaling of what we call paresthesia, the numbness and tingling. So that sensation, of course, is happening in the brain, but it's resulting from these areas where that sciatic nerve has been affected in some way, either direct impingement or uh, an, an inflammatory process causing swelling. So chances are your dad has probably been told by a doctor that he has a bulging disc or a slip disc or a herniated disc, whatever terminology. And the doctor probably said, what you need to do is lose weight if he's overweight. Uh, the doctor probably suggested that he's going to have to do some physical therapy to strengthen the muscles in the back. Because remember, let me grab this real fast. Oh yeah. Here are the vertebrae. Here's Right here is the spinal cord going down through the vertebrae, going down here. Here are the nerves that branch off of the spinal cord. So for instance, this one right here, if this, if this one right here is the sciatic nerve, what is happening, let me see if I can get this to bend enough. You can see that disc in between. If this vertebra moves too much, for instance, right here, that disc right there gets squeezed on one side more than the other. And that causes this uh, inner part of the disc to get pushed out. And in this case, it would press on this nerve here. So if that was happening down here, it would be pressing on this nerve. The thing that keeps all of these vertebrae in place are the muscles and the tendons that attach to them, as well as the ligaments that link all of these together. So if the muscles are weak or injured, they're not gonna be able to hold these in place. And I can't get it to bend well enough. And it's going to cause part of one of these discs to bulge out to one side and impinge on the nerve. This is why the first thing that most doctors suggest is physical therapy to strengthen those muscles. Okay, so um, basically you're saying the effects from the disc 
is what's sending the message out to the sciatic nerve? Because it's compressing on it uh -huh. or it's caused injury, which therefore creates inflammation, which brings swelling and the swelling is compressing on it. Okay, thanks. So that's the usual first fix is physical therapy to strengthen those muscles so that there's no shifting of those shifting of the vertebrae so it keeps them in their place if they shift too much like this it just squeezes out that that juicy nucleus propulsus center the next option after that is typically uh, injections of corticosteroids into that area of the back because the corticosteroids stop inflammation so if you stop the inflammation you stop the fluid you stop the swelling you stop the compression Yes, that's what he got. Okay. And then the next thing is going to be uh, fusion, where they will actually drill, like here and here, and get a metal plate and screw it so that these two are locked together so they don't move at all. It's a spinal fusion, or they call it a cage. And that'll stop any movement. So that's usually the last option. Physical therapy, then injections, then uh, spinal fusion. So what we want to do is we want to educate patients so they don't get to that to begin with. Because those, are, those aren't great choices. I mean, physical therapy is not bad. But getting injections, that's only a temporary fix. That's just stopping the inflammation. That's not fixing the underlying problem. And the doctor probably told him that the injections will probably last for anywhere from uh, six to 12 months. And they'd have to get, maybe have to get more done. And the ultimate fix is the spinal fusion. But I mean, that's surgery. And now you're messing around, you know, near the spinal cord. So. It's not optimal. But that's what happens with when that's what happens when people injure their lower backs. Again, if a person is overweight, especially for a long period of time, um, especially if they got a you know big beer belly, or if uh, she's been pregnant multiple times or if they were in a car accident or something or they're lifting heavy things using their back and not their legs uh, then those muscles get weakened and damaged and then that causes shifting to occur so what we try to do is we try to get people to understand that we don't want to get them to get to the position where those are the only three options left we want people to not be in that position to begin with. Okay, plus the neuron. So here is a nice enlarged image of that would be the axon. The Schwann cell wrapped around it. Each of those is one individual Schwann cell that wraps itself around. That creates the myelin, the insulation. And what that does is that allows that electrical current to leapfrog down and go quickly, but go at a steady rate. Um, I'm not, I'm, I don't think I'm going to test you too much on the, well, maybe. Multipolar neurons, that's the kind that I kind of drew as just the one axon, but lots of dendrites. Bipolar neurons basically have one dendrite, um, one branch, a couple of dendrites, sorry. And the unipolar Let me show pictures instead. 
make it easier. Multipolar, like I said, is kind of the one that I drew. Bipolar can have like just one basic single dendrite coming off of it. Unipolar, this is gonna have the ability to split off and it shows just one split here, but it can actually have several processes that split off of it rather than uh, just the one. They all act in a similar way, just typically in different areas. We talked about afferent, those are sensory neurons. We talked about efferent, those are the motor neurons sending messages out. Interneurons, kind of as it, as it sounds, uh, they can be sort of in between. And we see these, especially in the spinal cord, in what people call a reflex, like the reflex arc. I mentioned this a little bit ago when I said a person doesn't realize it and they put their hand on a hot stove. And as soon as their finger touches it, they pull their hand away and then they pull their arm away and they pull their whole body away. They sort of jump away from it. The reason it loops so quickly is because of the interneuron. It's gonna take that information coming in from an afferent neuron, quickly make a decision about it and send information out to the efferent to say, okay, go ahead and do what you need to do and move that arm out of the way. And then it will continue it up to the brain to say, oh, I just touched something hot. Okay, here's a good example. They're showing a attack, it looks like, right? Yeah. So the incoming message in blue, afferent, gets all the way up to the spinal cord. That little interneuron in between is taking that information. It's making a quick decision and then it's sending out messages that you better move your hand away. And that happens even before the message then goes up to the brain. And that kind of makes sense because when there's something really dangerous, and I mean attack, you might not think is very dangerous, but a hot stove could do a lot more damage very, very quickly. If it took the time to get that message all the way up to the brain to make a decision about it and then send a message back down again to move everything away, by that time, a lot more tissue damage can occur. So reflex arcs help to minimize that possibility of excessive damage. A synapse. is where one neuron meets another neuron. Now, technically, you can also say it's where a neuron meets a muscle, but that's why I say, I would rather call that a neuromuscular junction and save the word synapse strictly for what I'm talking about neurons. The end of one neuron meeting the dendrites of the next neuron, that's the synapse. The space in between is called the synaptic gap or synaptic cleft or synaptic, wait, synaptic gap, synaptic cleft, synaptic space, or just synapse. So it's, there's a little bit of different terminology for this, just the space in between. The word synapse itself means it's going to, typically it means it's going to include the end of the last neuron plus the space in between plus the dendrites of the next neuron. This is nice. Again, here's a nice cut section of the spinal cord, just like if they were cutting up carrots, slicing up carrots, you get a slice of spinal cord. The gray matter is made up of cell bodies and dendrites. The white matter is made up of axons that are covered in um, myelin. And the incoming message, 
or the afferent message comes into the back part of the spinal cord. And then the efferent message sending out to the muscle uh, extends from the front of the spinal cord, the anterior portion of the spinal cord. And that will kind of make sense maybe a little bit later. Okay, so we talked about nerves and how they are a bunch of neurons all in a line and then all sort of wrapped together. I'm not gonna talk about the different layers around it because this is just a lot more uh, detail than is not necessary. Tracks, uh, bundles of nerve fibers within the CNS. Um, I kind of think of tracks as like, like tunnels or like like specific tunnels that nerves travel through to go from the spinal cord to the brain. Uh, that's how I, I just always pictured them that way. Uh, that's how I remember them. White matter, like I said, this is all of the myelinated axons. Gray matter is all of the cell bodies and dendrites. So when you look at a section of the brain, you'll notice that on the outside, it kind of looks gray, but as you slice into it, the deeper you go, you start to see the white part, the white matter. That's the opposite of the spinal cord. As you saw in the pictures previous, the spinal cord is the white matter on the outside and the gray matter on the inside. The brain has the gray matter on the outside and the white matter on the inside. Oh, this is actually a good part. Nerve fibers do have the ability to be repaired at a small, small, small level. We have those germ cells that can become any cell that's in that area. So they can, they can repair to a small extent. Okay, where are we? 158. Da, 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 da. What do I want to do? Um. Okay. Here's where the physiology of the nerves come in. And very quickly, this tube that they're showing here, imagine this tube being that long axon, that long part of the neuron. And one thing you'll notice is there's a whole lot of sodium outside and potassium on the inside. Was, let me stop there. I thought they also showed the voltage. All right. So the inside of this long tube of axon has at rest, well, it's not doing anything, it has a certain amount of voltage that can be measured because of positives and positive and negative charges. And it's mostly negative. It's around minus 70 millivolts. So if we put more positive charges in there, that number will increase. So how are we gonna put more positive charges in there? Well, we have a lot of sodiums outside, some potassiums on the inside. So we're going to allow sodiums to move into that membrane. Something will trigger the membrane and say, go ahead, sodiums, come on in, which is going to add a whole lot more positives onto the inside of that cell membrane. 
And then eventually you can see here, some potassiums are going to move out. There's going to be a quick change in trying to get this back to the way that it was. Oops, sorry. This part here, where we have this rush of sodiums coming in, is what we call depolarization. This is that change of the electrical current on the inside of the cell. And then we're going to move these positive charges back out to reset the membrane to where it was before. This is what we call repolarization, getting it back to where it was. So you can see this. There we go. Uh, if you hooked up a device that measures electrical current in, in millivolts, especially very, very small millivolts, you can see where it starts at a, a resting number of about minus 70 millivolts. And then sodium starts to trickle in a little bit, which you can see at that zero line, where it says zero seconds or milliseconds in this case. And then suddenly there's gonna be a much, much bigger change in the amount of sodium that comes in and a spike. So in order for us to reach uh, the, the potential that the cell is gonna have, we have to get that way up, that number way up into the positive range. So it has to first go up, you see it here, where it starts to climb a little bit. Once it reaches this dotted line, we call that threshold. Once it reaches that, then we see a huge rush of sodium coming in, huge change in the positive uh, number in the electrical charge. And now we have something happening. Now we have something happening in the cell, or in this case, the electrical current moving. And then of course it has to reset itself, what we call repolarization. Now, let me see if I can, ah, there we go. This is what I was looking for. So here you see the tube again. We have more positives on the outside than there are on the inside. So it's more positive outside than it is on the inside of the cell. Therefore, it's more negative on the inside of the cell compared to being outside of the cell. But when those sodiums go rushing in, it suddenly becomes more positive right there as compared to the outside of the cell right there. More positive charges means here it's gonna be more negative. What's gonna happen next is that these positive charges are going to go into the cell, which is gonna cause the negative, uh, the outside to be more negative and the inside to be more positive. And these are going to move back out again but there's a hesitation because we want there to be a little bit of a hesitation so that this red arrow that we're gonna call our action potential, this electrical current continues in one direction. So these positive charges in the form of sodium ions move into the cell. Making it more negative on the outside right there. It's important that there's a little bit of a hesitation that these take a just a little slight second longer, I say second, millisecond longer to go back outside right over here because we want this signal to travel this way. We want it to go in one continuous direction. So as this becomes more positive on the inside right at this level, this electrical current is moving this way. And it's gonna take just a millisecond um, for the ones that are here now to reset and become more positive on the outside. That is our refractory period. Without that, we could have a signal that would go in no direction, it would just go back and forth. So if you look at the red arrow, the red arrow on the top is indicating the direction of the electrical signal. And we want it to go in this one direction. And that happens because positive charges move in, 
and then those positive charges are going to move back out but there's just that little brief hesitation before they move out again so that when these next ones move in the signal keeps going in that same direction if you've ever seen one of those signs let me do this real fast you ever see one of these electrical signs and they maybe i don't know look like an arrow and then there are light bulbs that's a bad light bulb there are light bulbs on it i know they look like mushrooms they're not mushrooms and what happens is this light bulb lights up and then just as it goes out this light bulb lights up and then just as it goes out, this light bulb lights up. And then just as it goes out, this light bulb lights up. And just as it goes out, this light bulb lights up. So it, what you see is a blink, 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 blink. So to your eye, it looks like you're just seeing this light traveling in this direction. But it's just the result of these light bulbs turning on and then turning off in the right sequence. The same kind of thing is happening with this action potential. As, oops, as a result of sodium moving in, moving in, and then moving in, and then moving in, as it moves in here, it's just about to move back out again, but right before it moves back out again, this moves in, the second one moves in. And so now that sodium can come out. And just before it moves back out again, this one moves in and then that moves out. And just before it goes back out again, this one moves in. So what that does is that takes that positive charge here, 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 moving in, 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 in one direction. That's it. Everything you think every single day, that's it. All based on that sodium moving in. Everything you touch and you feel is based on sodium moving into those uh, membranes in that order, sending the signal in one direction or the other. So what if you did something to block sodium from getting in. If you did something to block sodium from getting in, that signal would stop right here, which means it would never get to where it would have gone. Now, why would you want to do that? Well, imagine somebody cut their hand really badly and they had to go to the emergency department and they had to get stitches. Right before they stitch up that wound, what are they gonna do to the area to be polite? They're going to numb it. They're going to inject a local anesthetic agent in that area so that, oh, you don't feel anything. So when they're sticking that needle and pulling the thread through, sticking the needle and pulling that thread through, sticking the needle and pulling that thread through, you don't actually feel, you might feel the tugging, but you don't actually feel like the needle going in and going in and going in. Why is that? Because lidocaine is a sodium channel blocker. So it blocks that sodium from going in, which means that electrical signal that your, your skin is trying to send to your spinal cord and your brain that says, ouch, 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 gets stopped right here, which means it never gets to your spinal cord and never gets to your brain. So you don't feel it. You can do the same thing when she is in labor and delivery, 
they can inject an anesthetic agent into the space sorry into the space around a spinal cord called the epidural space and that anesthetic agent is going to block that signal from traveling up the spinal cord and therefore making childbirth completely painless and a pleasant experience for all more or less but remember that picture i showed you of the spinal cord a little bit ago i said the the incoming messages those would be like the pain messages um they're in the back and the nerves that are sending the signal to the muscles to say move your muscle or do something are in the front so if you send an as benton if you put that anesthetic agent in that area in the back it's going to mainly affect the nerves in the back so mainly the nerves that are going to send signals up to the brain that says ouch just hurts are going to be more affected and the signals from the nerves going down to the legs and feet are going to be less effective affected which means she doesn't really she doesn't feel as much pain but she can still wiggle her toes is that why they call it back labor no oh no Back labor, back labor can happen for other reasons, including position of the uterus, position of the baby as well, but position of the uterus even. All right. Dang it. Spend a little more time on that than I hope to. 15, but there's no, there's no shortcut to that, I'm afraid. As you can see, if this is your first time hearing about uh, electrical charges across a cell membrane, there's just no shortcut to that. There just isn't. So the best thing to do is try to get the big picture. And the big picture is it's an electrical current that is being sent down that nerve, down that neuron, and of course, therefore down the nerve, for instance. And it is based around sodium going into those cells. So if you block the sodium from going into the cells, you block the electrical current, which means you block the signal. Yeah, that's about the, the shortest short shortcut I can give you on that. Dr. Surgeon, is this information from today going to be on the meter? Yes including that refractory period that time frame where it takes a moment let me let me go back to that just for a minute i think it was the absolute refractory period brief period when a local area of an axon membrane resists re-stimulation So if you look at this, remember, we want that red arrow to go from left to right. We do not want it going backwards. So we want those sodiums to come in here and then here and then here and then here. We don't want this to suddenly go uh, back the other direction and have this one here suddenly come in because that would then change the direction of our red arrow. So there's a brief hesitation where these are coming in, but before this side here resets itself. There's that brief hesitation that allows these to come in just a fraction of a second faster, which keeps that arrow going this way. And that is dependent on that refractory period or here they have the absolute refractory period. Good thing to know. And we haven't even gotten to the brain stuff yet, which we will. Where are we? Okay, we're getting close. So I shortcutted some of that. This is showing how uh, the action potential is zipping on down 
through that dent through that axon uh, where when it reaches that node of Ron VA, this is kind of where we have that sudden influx of uh, sodium coming in. So that's why I say the signal kind of leapfrogs down from here to here to here to here. And in doing so, it keeps it moving quickly, but it moves it at a steady pace. So it doesn't go too fast. I talked about the synapse. I'm not going to worry too much about that. Yeah, okay. So let's see, let's look at this one. So here is the end of the neuron. Oh man, I want to take one more break. Here's the end of the neuron. This is going to represent the dendrite of the next neuron, for instance. So we have what they call a presynaptic cell, which is just the neuron. The electrical current is going to come zipping down in the form of, uh, in the form of what we call an action potential. That's going to trigger the release of these synaptic vesicles. They're going to release uh, their neurotransmitter across that space. So that space all by itself is referred to as the synaptic cleft or sometimes the synaptic gap or sometimes the synaptic space. And then those neurotransmitters are gonna to bind to receptors on the dendrite in this case of the next neuron. That's gonna cause a change in the membrane permeability and it will allow sodium to come rushing in, which now becomes an electrical current again. Yeah, I like this example better. So a synapse is going to include the end of this neuron, bloody hell, the beginning of the next neuron and the space. Technically, that is the synapse. Now, sometimes people will call just the space a synapse and that's fine. But most technically it has, it is the, end of the presynaptic, the space, and the beginning of the postsynaptic, FYI. Neurotransmitters, those are the chemicals that are going to function. Oh, uh, I guess it's something to hear. Class, neurotransmitters classified by their functions. So excitatory neurotransmitters, just as it sounds, going to cause uh, something to happen. It's going to cause a signal to continue, um, whereas an inhibitory neurotransmitter could do just the opposite, cause it not to happen. So if there's differences in the amount of neurotransmitters that gets released, that's going to change the signal. But also, if there's a difference in the number of receptors on the next uh, neuron, that's going to change the signal. So depending upon where the problem lies, is there not enough neurotransmitter or is there not enough signal, not enough um, receptors to get the signal, that will determine how we can fix this, or at least attempt to fix it. So we're not going to necessarily add receptors, but what we could do is we could keep that neurotransmitter in that place for longer. Or we're not necessarily going to make the cell release more neurotransmitter. We can just make it keep the, the neurotransmitter that's been released in that area longer. And that's what these types of antidepressant drugs do specifically. Selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. Remember when I was talking about the muscle and I said there's that little Pac-Man guy called choline esterase who recycles and picks up extra acetylcholine? Well, in the brain, in the nerves, there's recyclers as well. So if we can 
block those recyclers from doing their job, that's going to keep that neurotransmitter in that space longer, which means it's going to bind to those receptors longer, which means it's going to cause a stronger signal, stronger sodium coming in, stronger signal, which is going to change the person's sadness to happiness. At least that's the idea. And I'm not going to worry about the cocaine, but I talked about the anesthetics, sodium channel blockers. All right. Let's take, oops. I have a question before we take a break. Yes. So um, there's still two discussion posts in the, in this week and moving forward. Um, I just don't want to start them. And then if you're going to delete it, delete the one, because that's what happened to me last week. So is that your intention to go in and delete one for this week or no? Delete them. Yep. Deleting them. Deleting, okay. one of every, deleting one of everything. And there's no quiz. Like I said, I was sort of back and forth on this one, but uh, there was a couple of people who still had to finish the last quiz. And I kind of want you to really be focusing on studying for stuff uh, for, for the uh, midterm. So you said you're doing a study guide or just study the information that like the PowerPoints and stuff? Study, study like the notes. Okay. A lot. Study the um, videos a lot. And then I'm going to add an additional study guide. Okay. But is this your it. test or is it from the school? This is, this will be my test. Okay. Yeah. time that was a lot of stuff that was that was a lot of stuff all right um let's just take a few minute break just like we'll come back at like uh let me go back here so let me stop broadcasting six minute seven minute break come back at 2 30 pick up and get into some of this next stuff real fast not not too fast but what we don't finish, we'll just pick up next week. It's kind of important. So the test will include stuff up through uh, the neurology. 